And uh, very glad that I can a bit uh, block around our Viot Norwegian uh, publishing system. <laughs> um, actually, I don't know how much it's different from uh, many other countries. Uh, there's a similar system in Denmark and Sweden. Um, but uh, I think the Norwegians have uh, got a bit uh, over there. Uh, this is actually, uh, well, a lot of the work done by these two students, or actually he's working IT, just interested in uh, the replication crisis and uh, p-hacking. Uh, Ole Bredrik on the right and on the left, uh, Adrian Hussein will become a clinical psychologist. Give you a bit of background. Um, in uh, Scandinavia, so that's common in Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, we have an agency. It's the, also responsible for checking the GDPR and uh, a lot of other things. You can also archive there your uh, scientific data. So that one has also the uh, task of uh, classifying journals across disciplines um, into, uh, well, and publishers. Uh, by their quality. And this is human led. That means uh, we as researchers suggest a journal uh, that should be taken up. So, given the last 20 years or in particular last 10 years, there's lots of new journals, uh, you have actually to register suggesting it that it should be in the, in the system. Uh, and then there are yearly discussions. And uh, roughly the system, the X is very new, but it was always a a zero if there's no uh, good enough uh, ev evidence for peer review and some other quality signs, then the journal gets a marking of a zero. Uh, it can get a marking of a one. That means it passed the quality check or two passed the quality check. And the difference between the one and two is more or less um, how important is this journal as within a tiny subfield. And is this the journal that has the kind of highest quality? Highest quality does not automatically mean highest impact factor. So there is a bit of a, a link to it. But for example, trends in cognitive science was for years, and I'm not 100% sure what level it's still, uh, rated as number one. As a, it was level one, not level two, despite having a very good uh, impact factor. Uh, and that is because you have these subfields. Think, for example, of uh, this tiny field of pedagogical psychology. I mean, it must be just three or four people are doing that. <laughs> and then they have they have their tiny little journals. Maybe let's say they have three or four journals because of each of these pedagogical psychologists has their own journal that they run. And so um, then only one of those can get a two. So that is roughly. So within the big field of uh, psychology, uh, yes, you have environmental psychology, you have, I don't know, child psychology, you have autism. So all of them have at least one, and often just one, journal that gets a two. And this uh, example, if you take pedagogy or autism, this journal may not have an impact factor that might be higher than, let's say, uh, the average neuroscience journal. So it's not per se the impact factor. Um, the interesting case, I come back to it, is, for example, frontiers in psychology. It started off uh, being uh, rated as a one. Then in 2016, it uh, was rated as a two because it was at the forefront, uh, also in open uh, access, uh, and it has been voted that this is really uh, an uh, important journal for researchers in Norway. The crucial bit is Norway is also at the forefront, together with the Netherlands and some other, but not every country in terms of open access publishing. So there was a big uh, incentive there to these open access journals becoming a tours. Um, that's also a complicated issue. Here. Then it went in 2021 back to a one, and now it's actually an X. So there are people who are saying it's questionable how they review there. Uh, I know that this depends heavily on the editor because we have colleagues uh, within environmental psychology there that has extremely good reputation, frontiers, and then we have others say, just this is um, not worth to publish at all in that. Uh, the additional uh, layer here is that Norway has a very strange system of financing its universities. It's not just oil money, it's in principle. <laughs> um, it's, we don't care about research. Uh, and it is, this is unfortunately true. We don't care about research. <laughs> 
We just care about produce us some uh, employees. This is the official guideline. You're just paid by how many students graduate. That has been the case until 2001 or two. And that is now since a few months again the case. Universities get just the money by how many students they uh, manage to graduate. Nothing for research, none. How much you publish doesn't matter, where you publish doesn't matter. So <laughs> they did the change in 2003, four and said, oh, we want to be as good or better or at least not too bad compared to the Danish and the Swedes. <laughs> I mean, you're a little stealing, but okay, let's get them up there as well. And so they in four, now roughly 20 years, we had a publishing, uh, the universities got extra money or the money was, it's not extra money, the money was contingent on publications. So this is again now off. Since this year, we are again back to the system. Universities only get money for how many students they produce. Literally, we are a student production uh, company <laughs> now. Not research. And even they are officially now discussing cutting our research time down to 30% because we should just teach and produce students. So um, welcome to Norway. Um, <laughs> anyway, the bit we are looking at is did this um, incentives of that you get money, literally research money, for publishing um, also lead to some questionable research practices. And you are looking at p hacking. Um, what it did do is Norway has from two thousand three four to uh, now really catched up uh, uh, in terms of uh, caught up in terms of. Uh, publishing per uh, research at a university. So that is good. Um, maybe, we don't know, because quality, uh, quantity is not the same as quality. So that is just giving you an impression. We have lots of statistics because it's collected in Norway and because it's taxpayer money, all of this stuff is always really available. So that's also the bonus side of this. And you see the increase of level two journals is more or less absent, so it stays stable. And that is how it is. If you suggest a journal becoming level two, then you have to suggest a journal that is level two to get down ready to level one. But because of more and more journals popping up, this number increases. And uh, like I said, they also started, it's not really visible with this Nivo X where they just asking the community, well, please tell us and have a discussion. And these discussions are transparent, they are open. So you can read up uh, that. So yes, um, here a bit of uh, general issues why we think level two journal got its categorization in level two is that it might be because they uh, have their reputation. Uh, the editors look for well-powered studies, or at least that the study they then want to publish is a large effect size, not a D of uh, cones D of four, but maybe something that's uh, realistic. And uh, or it's about reputation on well designed studies. Level two is, as you saw, more heterogeneous. It has to be because it's a bigger uh, group. And it could be a definitely there are highly specialized journals for very specific, sorry for ranting on pedagogical psychology, mm -hmm. but uh, that's not my experience with them. And uh, uh, might be one particularly for. Uh, we have SAMI, so this is a minority, and uh, uh, maybe there might be something, uh, just a readership of 100 or so. Highly specialized, then to catch all journals, like scientific reports uh, or so. Uh, then also maybe some that are more questionable to uh, uh, um, Public Library of Science uh, one. And I'm choosing this one because uh, it has in its um, mandate uh, that uh, we should not uh, publish based on significance. Come back to that. So what would be possible outcomes of this incentive? Uh, like I said, you get more money if you publish in a level two journal than if you publish in a level one journal, three times more. So that adds up to a few peanuts. So you can bake either a small or a bigger peanut cake. I think it's, uh, for me, it varied between as a, if everything would have been level two, I might have had 3,000 euros roughly additional research money compared to 1,000 euros uh, research money, everything is level one. So roughly, that's just to give you a dimension. Um, so yeah, um, one of the options could be level two journals or 
bias towards novelty. Because these are the journals that don't have in their mandate that uh, it's the only publish uh, uh, the good design studies. Um, so then we would observe a higher um, discovery rate as a more uh, significant result. Uh, the other alternative would be in this level two journals, we uh, um, well, have the same or even a lower uh, observed discovery rate as a significant uh, studies that reach a significant result compared to these level one journals where you also have journals like yeah, uh, PLOS that um, you can publish null results. And um, how did we do now our study? Uh, in addition, Norway, we have uh, to register all our publications in a system. It's called Christine. Uh, from there, with, you know, with an API, we extracted the DUIs. Then this part next part, I can't tell you. It's called SI and then a hub. And um, that has to do with, um, because, yeah, the uh, other providers, they are now um, looking at the Scopus RP, but the other ones are not having access to the API. So we can't uh, extract um, um, the actual PDFs. And this, uh, sorry, I didn't mention this, is we are just looking at uh, the four big universities in Norway that have uh, psychology. Um, and uh, it's still over 8,000 articles, and we are not manually downloading them or asking the contacting all the uh, researchers. Then we are using the JEST uh, decoder and then the uh, ZFOX package. Uh, we are very glad uh, that this exists. And for um, some practical reasons, because of the extraction um, part, not so much the extraction, but for getting the PDFs, that's very, very little we have prior to 2005. Uh, and we had a few cases um, when I looked at the data uh, that uh, even the JAX decoder somehow found p is larger than one and I think this is not plausible. So I excluded those cases. The two students, Artheon and Olaf Lebrick, they were actually uh, starting this project from a totally different angle. They just looked at our department. Okay, who's the greatest P hacker? So this mm -hmm. is a colleague of mine. Um, so I'm not, I removed the name here. So this is the curve that looks suspiciously for P hacking. Um, and that is, it still has a, a high expected replica, uh, replicability rate. Um, but yeah, the ninety-four percent of all the studies are significant, uh, and the, like the simulated expected discovery rate is just sixty-four um, percent. So in comparison, I have too many null results. So that's that's fine. <laughs> um, I should stop publishing my results. So okay. So I have a little bit to help myself getting a feeling to these numbers use PLS1 as a benchmark. Uh, in our data set, we have three journals that are um, highly used, and that has a lot to do with this open access policy. One is Frontiers in Psychology with 116 um, publications, 78 in PLS1, and uh, in between those two numbers, I don't know exactly, maybe 100 or so, give or take a few in a Scandinavian journal of psychology or something like that. I don't even know exactly the truth. It's still not now published in there. So that is how it looks for PLS1. There's an expected uh, discovery rate of just 26. Wow. Uh, and an observed discovery rate of 66. Frontiers, as uh, said, has uh, 116 studies. This is not all of Frontiers and psychology published articles. That is the uh, Norwegian data set uh, we extracted. The observed discovery rate is uh, 68%, but the expected discovery rate, this um, uh, confidence interval is really broad, I think, 27 to 73. So the algorithm with just 116 study cannot nail this down. So now I quickly show you how these curves look like. I split them into three um, periods, the 2005 to 2010, as a prior to the replication crisis, um, and when it was in the media, then the part, I think of publications always lacking a little bit. I mean, you're not, can take two years or so before your study is um, published. 
then 2011 to 2016, and then 2017 to 2020, 2022. Um, and then split in level one and level two. You may not see much on those figures, but okay, yeah, it's 81 uh, percent of observed discovery rate prior to this article about talking about replication prices in level one journals. And it also is the time when in Norway suddenly you got money for publishing. As of more and more researchers got pushed, we literally pushed into, okay, I have to publish. Before you, uh, you would publish when you maybe had something solid, maybe my speculation. So then it looks here for level two, then the next uh, period, and so on and so on. And I summarized this actually here in those tables. Uh, which I think is a bit more um, easier to see the differences. And to my surprise, um, I was not really expecting that. Uh, the um, observed discovery rate stays the same for level two journals. For researchers in psychology, also working at a psychology department, they don't need to be psychologists, uh, and in Norway. So how much this generalizes? Um, most likely not, because Norway is a bit weird. Um, Anyway, this level two uh, observed discovery rate uh, is very similar to PLS1 and remains stable. It is not the case for level one. Uh, there it actually converged to a more realistic one, and it seemed uh, that, uh, yeah, pure speculation that maybe in the beginning you try to publish things that were at this early before the replication crisis. Uh, small studies in small journals or that uh, yeah maybe wouldn't replicate nowadays. Um, the expected discovery rate overall increases. So um, if you're familiar with uh, Shimak's work, then you know you can from this deduce the selection bias, and that means overall. And I think that's a positive trend. Um, the selection bias decreases. Um, but it's still there. And I think what is also important to note is, uh, and these are not the point values, if I include the confidence values, a um, uh, bit more spread, of course. But um, the uh, uh, selection bar is actually still larger, and that is a bit surprising to me. Um, I don't know whether it's significantly larger, um, but uh, uh, just on the point values uh, in level one and level two drills. So there seems to be some justification for having this distinction in level one and level two. What about the expected replication rate? Yeah, that also converges um, to some extent and is uh, increasing actually in level one, uh, Jonas. Yeah, and I, I again see that it's more or less if you look at the confidence uh, intervals, um, yeah, uh, steady for level two. And it's not so far from the PLOS one. But to sum it up, this system of classifying journals into zero, one, and two, I actually think uh, honestly also that this helps because with this sheer amount of journals you can choose from or you get in your spam filter or some managed get through, you can go at this website, look up for this journal and get actually a, a rating and information at this open access and it's in Sherpa, is a DOI and all this, so that's good. Um, the uh, bad thing was it might have introduced some gamification, um, but that's actually what we're not seeing in our data. The, uh, in my opinion, but the not so nice thing is uh, it's still personal taste a bit, and some of these discussions, for particular with frontiers, it's. I think there's more subjectivity than objectivity in there. Um, so uh, particularly now moving it to an X that you get no points. But anyway, the government now is not giving us points any longer. So it doesn't matter any longer. And there are two major issues. We could not retrieve all articles. And it's very hard to prove, or it's actually there's an article showing it's not possible to show that it's missing by randomness. So, but we will try to do some quality check with uh, a year and uh, an institute and see whether it, it would change. And the other one is uh, 
the uh, data extraction, this a draft recorder was automatically, but as you can think of a paper, you may have lots of statistical tests. Some have 48 even, some have just one or two. Uh, and if you, for example, run an RCT, uh, you may want to report lots of null results because uh, at T0, your groups are not different. So we still need to do that. We have to find the main hypotheses and not just all statistical tests. So um, that is um, where yeah, maybe some hackathons can let us there. That's all I had. Thank you. Mm -hmm.